Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. I'm your host, Joel Brown, and we have my cousin, the legendary motivational speaker, the man, the myth, the ultimate motivator, Mr. Les Brown. Les, welcome to the Addicted to Success podcast. Thank you very much, cousin. I like that. The ultimate. That's better than master motivator. The <laughs> ultimate motivator. I love that. Thank you yes. very much. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my heavenly father, which out of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah, Les, look, I, I've just got to say, man, I've, uh, you know, growing up listening to your uh, audios, I listen to it, It's uh, Possible. I listen to a number of your uh, videos that are online and uh, I've read a number of your books. So, you know, you've, you've played a huge part in my understanding of what it really means to personally grow and to self-develop. And I just got to say, man, it's just a, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. I, I'm very honored. And I want to thank you for the work that you're doing because there are lives that you're transforming. And one of the things I believe that Evil prevails when good men and women do nothing. And you have stepped up and decided that you'll create a platform that you can help people to get a larger vision of themselves beyond their circumstances and mental conditioning. So because of you, the world is a better place today. So thank you for who you are and how you represent yourself. I'm proud to have you as my cousin. <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Les. So, Les, let's, let's get down to really what do you believe is is or has been your finest moment so far in your career? Because you've been around for a little while now. You've been rocking stages for many decades. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people would say when I spoke in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta mm. to over 80,000 people, and a lot of people would say that when I was in Poland and spoke to over 25,000 people and traveled to over 49 countries. But I believe that my greatest accomplishment, that my children have decided that the message that I bring to the world is a message that they believe in, that they have embraced, that they now embody. And they are now speakers and authors, and we are called the first family of motivation. I remember reading something by Jacqueline Onassis, the, the wife of John F. Kennedy. She said, if I make all the money in the world, and my children don't amount to anything, then what have I done? Wow. And I am so proud that my children, they believe in my message. And now Ona, my daughter, who her, she spells the name O-N-A, Ona Brown, she teaches a class called Own Your Dreams. My son Patrick, Preparing for Tomorrow. My daughter Serena, she has hers. It's focused on kids. So I, I have 10 children and five boys and five girls. And so, you know, Lord say, be fruitful and multiply. I took him seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes so, so that's like my greatest accomplishment. When they met together and said to me, Dad, for a long time we were angry with you because you missed special occasions. Mm. But now that we're adults, and we see what you have done with so little. And now, as we are now working on our dreams, we realize that there are two things that's very important in becoming successful. One is service. The greatest mm -hmm. among you will be your servant. The, yeah. the quality and the quantity of the service that you, you provide determines how successful you are. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is sacrifice, that a dream comes with a cost. And you've got to ask yourself the question, what am I willing to sacrifice? What am I mm -hmm. willing to give up? Because it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of failures, a lot of disappointments, a lot of setbacks along the way. But make sure that that dream is, is what you consider your assignment, that that's the calling on your life. And mm -hmm. as much as I have chosen this, I believe it has chosen me to speak and to train speakers. And so to have my kids now say, we have that calling on our lives, that's my greatest accomplishment. Amen, brother. Amen. 
I'm not there yet. I don't have kids yet, but I could imagine just like, you know, from the day that they're born to seeing them actually out there in the world and lit up and inspiring others and carrying on legacy. That's that immortal, uh, you know, impact and contribution that's out there in the world. I think it's pretty incredible. It is. And, and, and I have a lot of spiritual sons and daughters because when I think about my life, born in an abandoned building on a floor at a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City, when I think about the fact that I'm here being interviewed with you because of two women, one gave me life, the other one gave me love. God mm -hmm. took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And so when I think about being labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade and failing again in the eighth grade and no college training, and someone spoke to me that he was a teacher who told me someone's opinion of me does not have to become my reality. And he mentored me. He gave me a vision of myself beyond where I was. He, he had your kind of energy, Joe. He spoke to me and, and he helped me to get a vision of myself doing more, having more, experiencing more, and that my circumstances did not have to define me. And I believe that that's the value of what you provide in your programming, that there are people who are addicted to drugs, to alcohol, that people who are addicted to entertainment and addicted to failing. It's, it's a way of life. It's it's an unwillingness to change your behavior, to change your mindset, to change your choices, to change your relationships. And so you are breaking new ground. You're saying to people at any given day, choose ye whom ye shall serve. At any given day, you can make a commitment that I'm going to be addicted to success. I'm going to be addicted to making choices that represent the highest in me and the best in me and that will empower me to create the greatest version of myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially and relationship-wise. And so that's why I feel that you are a blessing to the planet. I'm so honored to be able to be interviewed by you. Ah, thank you, brother. You know, it's interesting because some people will say to me, oh, Joel, it's not good to be addicted to success. And I always ask them, what's your definition of success? What is it? What, what's your definition, Les? My definition of success is doing something that you feel passionate about that is in service of others, that can help other people, that can make a difference. The place where I am in my life, a, a, Russian, a, a Russian author, Leo Tolstoy said, as I face inevitable death, what in my life will not be un done or destroyed when I'm gone. And he was reflecting on the meaning and the purpose of his life. And that's where I am, that I believe the, the lives that I've influenced, the, the, speaker, the speakers that I've trained and the people that they will influence, that that work will not be undone or destroyed when I'm gone, that they will go into a future that I will not see. So I'm building a legacy because success, as Bishop T.D. Jake said, success without success, successors, is failure. I've been very successful. Yeah. Now I'm training my successors so that my work will go on into the future. And I'm excited about building that legacy now and that my children are a part of it. Beautiful. Yeah, I heard a saying uh, the other day. It said, leaders create leaders. Like, there is no leadership if it's just you. And you're yes. not leaving that legacy. So I love that. That's really awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that, Les. Les, what books have you been reading lately? Because I know you're, you're an avid reader. Yes. The book that I'm reading, I wrote the forward to, it's called The Road to Your Best Stuff. The Road to Your Best Stuff by Mike Williams. Mike Williams is my mentor. He's been so for 46 years. And he is the strategist who saw this Les Brown first. I was a disc jockey at WVKO radio station. At that time, I was a different personality. Look out, baby, this is me. 
LB Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing Papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only, young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and duplicably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, out of your love bed. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad, yo. No, you didn't skip a bait, man. You didn't skip a bait. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that was many years ago in, in the 1970s, and he came into the studio one day and he said, hey, Brownie. I said, what? He said, you know why you go see Zig Ziglar and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Wayne Dyer and Tony Robbins and all those guys? I said, yes, I like their message. He said, no, not just that. He said, that's in you. He said, you love to help people. Every time I look around, you're holding court here at the radio station and you got a little funny laugh. He said, man, you could do that. And I said, Mike, come on, man. You know, I can't do that. I have no college training. I, I can't compete with people with PhDs and MBAs and years of corporate experience I don't have. And, and Joe, he said, Brownie, all of us are born the same way, dumb, naked, and speechless. You can <laughs> learn. I said, whoa. Yeah. And so he said, and I'll, I'll teach you. And so he became my mentor. One of the things I believe that's important for people, because it took him 14 years to convince me. 14 years, one of the regrets mm -hmm. that I have. And I believe that you have to believe in somebody else's belief in you until your belief kicks in. Yeah. And I asked him one day, I said, what made you call me every year for 14 years asking me, what are you gonna do with your voice? What are you gonna do with your story? You got a story. and. I said, what made you do that? I was on CBS, on a radio station in Los Angeles. And he said to me, Joe, I just thought it was my duty to stay in your ear. And I said, man, I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you did. And so I lost 14 years, but I can't unscramble those days. So I'm paying it forward. Every day that God gives me breath, my goal is to use my voice and my story to change lives. Oh, I love it, Les. Les, how old are you right now? 72. 72. I'll tell you what. Yes. You, you called me and you reached out to a number of my friends and we were all talking the other night. Uh, Mark Lack actually is one of, my, one of my friends you spoke to. And we were laughing. We're like, man, Les is around 70. I didn't know exactly your age. And we were like, man, this guy is on his hustle. Like that's... That's what we want to be like when we're at your age too, is just like continue to, to really be out there and, 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 you know, moving the needle in the world. Yes. A friend of mine that I'm now training and, and I'm in this place where he is, he said, it's about the best of my life versus the rest of my life. Yes. 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 It, it's about raising that bar. You know, Einstein said that thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. So it's about raising the bar on myself, dying to who I've been to give birth to who I must become and to become as Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God and start, start writing a new chapter. Every day we have the opportunity to write a new chapter. I told my kids when I die, I said, tell them not to embalm me right away. Come down to the funeral home and put a microphone in my hand. I said, if I don't grab it and sit up and say, you got to be hungry, they say, dad's going now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. A microphone in your hand could wake the dead. That's, a, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome stuff. You probably wake everybody else up in that wake room or at the graveyard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it, Les. Les, what do you believe uh, separates the top 2% of the most successful people in the world from the rest? What is it? Well, I think that, number one, there are some people who have privilege. I, I look at President Donald Trump. Had former President Barack Obama entered the White House and created as much stress and drama and chaos as President Trump has, Millions of people would have been marching in the streets saying, impeaching, impeaching. But he's a white boy. He gets a pass. He has white privilege. When I got out of high school, I worked for Sears. And the 
division where I worked, they said, if you become the top salesperson, you'll become the sales manager. And so you would earn more money. And so as a result of that, guess what? I became this top sales manager six months in a row. Wow. But because I had the complexion of rejection, I didn't get the promotion. Because, yeah, and so I had to train people under me, white guys, who then they became my sales manager and they made more money than me because they had the complexion of connection. So just being real, there are some people because of where they are, because of the government, because of the structure, because of the culture, there are some people that where they are, the circumstances don't prevent, don't provide for them to advance. Because when I graduated from high school in this country, a white college dropout had more of a chance of getting a job than a black college graduate. So mm. there are people who in certain cultures, certain governments, that in spite of their dreams, in spite of what they want to do, in spite of what they want to accomplish, the structure where they are, because when Napoleon Hill came along, pass me that, please. That's why I'm pointing at it. Yeah, excuse me. When Napoleon Hill came along, guess what? Black people had to sit at the back of the bus. Yeah. When I, yeah. So the, there were, the, we, we, had to, we had to go to inferior schools. So we, we were relegated to a different place in society. Things have improved, but just trust me, if, if Barack Obama had come into office like Trump, it would have been a different game, but he let the record show. So, yeah. but, in, but, but to places where people have access, let me speak to that. Yeah. You have to constantly cultivate a vision of yourself beyond your circumstances and mental conditioning. You've got to see yourself achieving what it is you want. For instance, I used to have a talk show and I used to put my picture on the television screen and I visualized myself having a talk show. Ultimately, King World paid me $5 million to do the Les Brown show. Highest rated, wow. fastest canceled talk show in the history of the world. <laughs> okay. That's an achievement. Wow. That's what you, at least I had one, but I refused to do trash. I wanted to do something motivational. They wanted me to do conflict and controversy. I said, that's not who I am. Yeah, don't sell so, yourself. The, but but I, I accomplished that, okay? So the, the I saw myself speaking before thousands of people long before I accomplished that. If people watching now, if they go on YouTube and put in Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome, They'll see me speaking to over 80,000 people. I was there years before I accomplished that. I visualized myself being in the Georgia Dome, speaking on that stage, and it came to pass. Because in alignment with the vision, I also was willing to commit myself to the work. There's a movie called The Secret People Love Very Much. One of the things that was conspicuously absent from the the secret was the word work. You can think all you want, but if you don't work, trust me <laughs> on that. The W in work stands for the willingness to do whatever is required. The O stands for optimism, being perpetually optimistic in spite of the, the failures and the setbacks and the disappointments that you will have. You will fail your way to success. The R stands for reinvent yourself. In order to do something you've never done, You've got to become someone you've never been. And the next thing is the K stands for kindred spirits. In order to grow, you've got to look at your relationships. You earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, if you are the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So in order to achieve your goals, mm -hmm. a willingness to do what is required, optimism, a, a, a feeling that in spite of the the, the setbacks and the disappointments, I got to saying if life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. And you're, <laughs> you're reinventing yourself because you don't get in life what you want. You get in life what you are and upgrading your relationship, practicing OQP, only quality people, creating collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. That, to me, work. 
that kind of work will allow you to manifest your dream. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yes, yes, I love it, Les. Les, I love that you touched on the uh, the like the law of attraction, right? Because that is a confusing thing for some people. And you being in the industry for decades, you would would have seen this shift in the industry. There's a lot of this like new age spirituality coming in now, and I feel like some of it, not all of it, but some of it can make it sound a little bit fluffy and a little bit kind of sit there and wait for it to come. And I, when I coach, I always say like, yeah, cool that there's a law of attraction, but I believe in the law of intention, setting your intentions and going for it as opposed to sitting and waiting for it to come. I agree with you 100%. When you look at Unity, it started with Myrtle Fillmore and, and, and her husband, and Science of Mind started by Ernest Holmes and Joel Goldsmith, and I, I studied New Thought, and, and I'm a metaphysician, that they also left our work because they were successful. <laughs> they had money already. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you have to... At least they'll be honest. Is, yes, you have to be intentional about it. You have got to decide that you're going to do it. There's a formula that I work with when I train speakers and how to tell their story because I said that when you're telling your story, something happens when you're speaking to an audience. You distract, dispute, and inspire. You do, How people live their lives you know, as a result of the story they believe about themselves. So when you do your show, what you do is that based upon your personality and how you communicate and the things that you share and the people that you interview, you distract people from their current story. And through the course and the execution of your guests and, and, and how you share ideas, you dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to make new choices. And so when people have had an interruption in their belief system, and get a new vision of themselves, that that expanded vision caused them to show up differently in life, and then it pushes them into creating a new reality. And that's the work you and I are engaged in, because we all have the ability to do more. And, and the reason we don't, I believe, is because most of us live in environments where we're told more what we can't do rather than what we can do. In fact, uh, there's a book called Learned Optimism. And in that book, uh, Martin Seligman, he talk about the fact that between ages zero and five, we determine what's available to us and what's not available to us. And why I encourage people to get the book, The Road to Your Best Stuff by Mike Williams, and they can get it on Amazon. What Mike did, he inspired me in a way that it caused me to feel uncomfortable playing and living a small life. He said, Les, you can't, you, you can't build a, a big life with a small dream. Don't, don't just think in terms of being the number one disc jockey in Columbus, Ohio. You have something for the universe. And it, I just didn't think, come on, Mike, me? Who would pay to hear me speak? Who, what corporations, and not mind you, uh, because of that conversation, I've spoken for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, McDonald's Corporation, General Electric. Because of that conversation, I've earned in one hour and a half, and I don't say this to impress anybody listening, but to impress upon you, you've got greatness in you. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. I've earned over $410,000 in an hour and a half. I did wow. not know that that was available to me. I had no idea. I remember the time when creditors would call the house and my children would ask the father and say, my daddy say he ain't whole. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yo, yeah. I used to be so broke I could walk past a bank and trip the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's so classic. I did it, man. I mean, oh, my God. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And, 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 and I believe if people continue to listen to you with an open mind and not listen to, we have two voices inside of us. The voice that's been given to us by the world, be ye not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by renewing of your mind. 
and, and allow themselves to be inspired. When I speak, my goal is it's possible you can live your dream. And it's necessary that you reset, that you restructure your thinking, that you work on yourself. Let go of be drag. Let go of the negative, toxic, energy-draining relationships in your life. And it's necessary that you have goals beyond your comfort zone. Because in order to do something that you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. And it's necessary that you embrace failure. You will fail your way to success. Walt Disney failed seven times and had two nervous breakdowns. But he never, no, he, he, had, he, he filed bankruptcy seven times and had two nervous breakdowns, but he did not give up on his dream. And it's you. And it's hard. I told Mike, I said, Mike, man, it'll be hard for me to compete with people with PhDs and MBAs and corporate experience I don't have. And he said, Brownie, Brownie, listen to me. If you do what is easy, come up with excuses. Put yourself down. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. Joe, he was right. I put in the word. Mm -hmm. I started memorizing three to five quotes a day. I started reading a minimum of 30 to 40 pages every day. There's no speaker on the planet that no more quotes than I do. And I don't brag about that because what he taught me, he said, the majority of these speakers, they have memorized scripts. He said, you want to speak from your heart. When you're speaking from a script, you're speaking from the head. Words from your head goes to the head. He said, when you speak from the heart, those words go to the heart. He said, you want to speak from your heart and tell your story. And people will feel you. He said, the key is to create an experience for people. Because Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept of experience, it could never be satisfied to going back to where it was. Mm -hmm. And so he did that with me. And that's what I look to do with every audience that I speak to. And that's what has allowed me to be able to still be here after doing it for over four decades. Wow. 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 Guys, if you're listening to this right now and you are a mentor of some sort or a coach or a speaker, take note because you want to be that person that tells people it's totally possible when they're sitting and shaking in their boots about this like dream and vision they have. You're the one there that says it is possible. You know, I think, Les, that we, uh, we tend to think about all these relics that we hold in the past and we make a story out of the relics. But really, what if we made a story out of what was actually possible? We come from a very wow. different place, right? Yes, without any question. And, and that most certainly is necessary because we're living in a time of what the late Peter Drucker calls accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. Just think about mm -hmm. it. I used to run my office with 26 people. Guess what? Now, this is all I have. Yeah. A phone. <laughs> I, believe I run that. my office now with a phone. I don't need 26 people. I was about to buy uh, something I saw that's called a, a studio in a box. It costs around $10,000. Now there's something called Mevo, and it costs $700. And you can put it in your pocket, and it can take several shots of you. You can have a studio in your house. And it will go through all the platforms, YouTube, it will go through <laughs> Twitter, it will go through Facebook, all the platforms. So I, I remember when Time Magazine in 2007 said the computer is the person of the year, I said, why would they say that? Because for the first time in the history of the world, everyday people have access to information. Knowledge is the new currency. So now you can have a global business with your phone. That's, that's real from the comfort of yeah. your home. So this is a thinking person's world. So when you can communicate, when you can present yourself and you're thinking and you create collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships that inspire you to create the greatest version of yourself as an entrepreneur, as a father, as a person in a community that want to bring about social change, the possibilities are unlimited. Mm -hmm. 
Hey man, it's edgeless. That's right. Yeah. Les, Les, this will blow your mind. This iPhone here, right? Back in the 1950s, the amount of processor power they had in the computers to launch rockets to the moon is what we hold in our iPhone today. We could launch yes. a rocket with this thing and it's in our pocket. <laughs> right, right. And now we want to launch our dreams. Yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Further than the moon. <laughs> Right. There you go. Les, we had a few people uh, from Addicted to Success. Some of our community here sent in some questions. They're big fans of yours. And uh, we had Carrie Azuma asked, how do you choose to show up for others when you're going through a really hard time yourself? I do that every day. That's a very good question. Every morning. What's the person's name again? Uh, Carrie. Carrie? Carrie, yeah. Carrie, Carrie, every morning when I wake up, I deal with cancer. Doctors told me four years ago that cancer metastasized in four areas of my body. This is the 21st year that I am a cancer conqueror. Every morning when I wake up, every time I climb on a stage and grab a microphone, I deal with sciatica pain on my right side. And I deal with arthritis in my scapula area on the left side every day. Now, here's something. In life, it's like Forrest Gump said, life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> that you're either in a problem, just left one, or headed toward one. <laughs> it's called life. You have to deal with it. Suck it up and do what you have to do. I was going out speaking to people, telling them they have the power to live their dreams. I was sleeping in my room on the, on the 21st floor in the Penobscot building in my office, bathing in the sink down the hall, hiding in the closet when the janitorial service came so they wouldn't tell management that I was sleeping in my office. I went out and I spoke in spite of the fact that I was living in my office, in spite of the fact when I would go to various friends' cities and I didn't have money to stay in a hotel and I slept on their couch or I slept in a car if I was driving, you have to make your stuff happen in spite of. Next question, please. <laughs> Great point. Thanks so much, Les. I appreciate it. Yeah, we have one come through from... Uh, Yasmin, okay, so Yasmin asks, how do you stay focused? In a world of distraction, Everything. right? We're in a big world of distraction with social media and everything. How do you stay focused? There always will be distractions. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to, at the end of the day, I review what I've done. And then I write down seven things that I want to achieve tomorrow. I write those seven things down. So when I get up in the morning, I have an agenda for my day. If you don't have an agenda for your day, most people are just trying to get through the day. You want to get from the day those things that you place on your agenda. If you don't have an agenda for your life, you will be a part of somebody else's agenda. So therefore, you have to figure out what is it that I want to achieve with my life and look at where you're going and lay out a plan of action that will move you in that direction. Robert Shula said this, and it's real. People don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. I guarantee you, if you knock on 100 people's doors and say, hey, excuse me, show me your plan of action for the goals that you want to achieve in your life this year. How much will you be worth three years from now? Can you show me a plan of action or what is it that you're going to do to increase your value? Because you don't get paid by the hour, you get paid for the value you bring to the hour. I guarantee you the majority of the people would look at you with a face of confusion and they will not have anything to show for you. If you're serious, you write your goals down. That engages the subconscious mind. If you're serious, you will review them on a regular basis. If you're serious, you will create a team of people of collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships that will help you make it because you can't make it by yourself. One goose can fly 75% further in formation than up with other geese than it could ever fly by itself. 
Mm. Next question. Love it, love it. Les, what's the biggest curveball that you've had thrown at you and how did you break through it? The biggest curveball I ever had thrown with me when I took my mother to the doctor and the doctor said she had terminal cancer. She had breast cancer. I never forget as I was walking my mother to the car and I was trying to maintain my composure. And I drove past a, a, what was called a furniture warehouse. They had a lot of furniture in this place. And I was holding my tears back. I wanted to be strong for her. And when we went there, it's a huge place. I said, Mama, let me get a wheelchair for you. And at that moment, I'll never forget, she looked at me, she said, Leslie, you want me to buy into what he just said? She said, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. She said, I can walk this myself. I said, whoa, did I just start crying? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is my strength, you know? I'm a mama's boy, you know? Yeah. And that was a challenging experience for me. I, I never saw anyone die before. And I remember holding her hand. I remember when she looked off into the distance and um, a tear coming out of her left eye. And I remember talking to her and saying, thank you. Thank you for for choosing us. Yeah. Thank you for making me the person I am, for being such a powerful woman. You know, there's a saying, a woman can't teach a boy how to be a man. That's a lie. My mother taught me how to be a man. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, I remember she said, my brother, we, he slept on the right side. I'm a twin. And I slept at the foot of the bed so she wouldn't try and get out of the bed to go to the bathroom by herself and fall. And I remember her saying, turn the light out. And I said, Mama, the room is dark. I'm at the foot of the bed. I had a recliner chair. And he slept on the, the, the side of the bed. She had a huge bed. I said, it's dark. And so Wesley said, Wesley, Mama sees the light. Mama sees the light. And then she said, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. And that gave me comfort, Joe. Yeah. Because I didn't think I could make it through. I remember saying, Lord, don't let Mama die. I'd rather die for her. She gave her whole life to us. You know, I'm young. I'm strong, whatever she has given to me. Yeah. But she made me know mm. that she was all right in spite of. She was a strong woman, man. She raised seven children by herself. Mm. She had a third grade education. Mama never, ever had any children she gave birth to, but she had a passion for raising children. She worked for wealthy families on Miami Beach. She cooked for them, and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. She kept their children, and we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. And I used to say, Mama, what is it, Leslie? When I become a man, and what happened for me, Joe, one of the families she worked for, this guy listened to Earl Nightingale every day. It's called The Strangest Secret in the World. And I would shine his shoes and listen. Unbeknownst to me, it was programming my mind. That's why if people watching, if they go to the Georgia Dome speech where I do a speech call, it's not over till you win mm. and watch it 90 days straight, it will transform their mind like that transformed my mind. And so I had this vision of buying groceries for us, buying our own food, of having new clothes that no one else had worn. And I had this vision of buying my mother a home. And I bought her four homes before she passed at 89. And wow. that's why I speak so passionately about the work that you do, because I know it works. 
that we live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. And we have to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to break through, to have a larger vision of ourselves doing more and experiencing more in spite of. Yes. Les, I, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate you sharing that and digging deep. This is the real stuff right here. This is what life's about, really. Um, yes. It, when you were sharing that, I was imagining as well at the same time, me having to go through that with my mom, you know, and it's like, I couldn't understand it, man. I haven't been through it yet, but one day, you know, yes, it'll happen. And it's um, a part of the process. life. Yeah. What do you, let's go a little bit deeper. What do you believe happens when you die? You know, I don't believe in death. Right. I, I believe in the transition. I believe there's another dimension. Awesome. And yes, now, I, there are things that I know and things that I do. I don't know how I know those things. I don't mm. know how I know. There, there, I, I had an experience this year where I almost died. And I believe that somebody's hand is on me. I believe that my birth mother and my adopted mother and my best friend, Boo, that they're looking out for me on the other side. I believe I'm being guided and people are looking out for me. I mean, look at, there's no way that I could do what I've done by myself without spiritual energies on the other side. I believe in angels. You're an angel in my life. I yeah. believe in angels that when we commit ourselves to an intention to live our greatest life, that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for us. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, part of, a part of my speech that I give, and I hope more people would. Uh, are you broadcasting this live? We will be, yeah. It's, it's, well, it's yeah. going out, yeah, to the masses for yeah. sure. Yeah, I, I, I'd like people to ask more questions, but there's a, there's a story that I tell by Dr. Howard Thurman. He said the ideal situation for a man or woman to die, he said, is to have family members praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghost of the dreams, the ideas, the abilities given to you by life, but you, for whatever reason, you never pursued those dreams. You never acted on those ideas. You never used those gifts. And there they are standing around your bed looking at you with large, angry eyes saying, we came to you. And only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you die today, what dreams, what ideas, what abilities, what talents, what gifts will die with you? Miles Monroe, a good mm -hmm. friend of mine who died in a plane crash, he said, the wealthiest place on the planet is not in the four east where there's oil on the ground. It's not in South Africa. He said, where there are diamond mines. He said, the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. Because there you find dreams never pursued. There you find authors who never wrote, singers who never performed, speakers who never spoke, potential greatness that we never heard from. Oh, that just gave me chills. <laughs> Chevrolet, Honda, Honda, Toyota, Toyota, Toyota. Tie my bow tie, tie my bow tie. I'm sorry. My medication wearing off. I'm so sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Les. I, you know what I often thought? Like you and Miles would be passing the torch back and forth. You guys have just incredible energy. And um, yeah. it was sad. I wrote the it was first, sad I wrote the, Yeah, I wrote the forward to his book, his first book. We were very close friends. Yeah. Very yeah. close friends. Yes. He spoke yes. so highly of you as well, by the way. He was like, he gave you, you a lot of credit and he said you're an incredible speaker uh, and oh, an incredible friend. So, yeah, you know, he's a guy that's left legacy, man. I really believe his time was yeah. up. He fulfilled his purpose in so many ways. So, yes. yeah, that's awesome. We have a couple more questions. Do you have some time, Les, to, to continue on with a yes, couple? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Les. Appreciate it. Les, we have a question by uh, Nash Mackey, who's out in Australia as well. And uh, he asked, Les, what was the driving force to make you go after your dreams? And what is still driving you today? What's your why? When I went 
to the store with my mother. She had lost her job. And they would not hire her because they said, because of arthritic shoulder and her knees, that she was too old. And she made a commitment when she adopted us that we will never go to bed hungry. I went with her to Joe's Market. And my mother was a very proud woman. And she asked Joe, would he give her groceries on credit? And Joe said, Mamie, I will to help you with those kids. And I remember going home with my mother and I was crying and she said, um, what are you crying for? I said, I want to be a man. She said, Leslie, you're 10, you'll be a man soon enough. I said, I know, but I want to be a man now because I'm a man now. I said, I will never ever let you have to go to anybody for food. If I was a man and she's working in a job where a lady told her to go, Mrs. Sadursky, to ask her to go in a room to look for something for a hat. And I heard my mother clapping her hands. And I was curious. I said, Mama, why are you clapping your hands? And she said, don't you worry. She said, do what you're supposed to do. And don't worry. Clean the spots up off that floor in the kitchen. Then she went in another room and she started clapping her hands again. I said, Mama, what are you doing? Clapping your hands. Why are you doing that? Then Mrs. Sadursky came over to me. She said, I can tell you why she's clapping her hands. Because when I have people who work for me look for something and I can't see them, I make them clap their hands to make sure that they're not stealing. Whoa. Joe, huh. at that time I dropped the washcloth, I stood up, I looked her in the eyes, and during this time you weren't supposed to look white people in the eyes. I looked her in the eyes. I said, my mother is not a thief. She loves you, she loves your children. When she talked to our neighbors, she said, my children, the Sadursky children. I said, my mother would never steal from you or anybody. And I told my mother, I said, when I become a man, nobody will never make you clap your hands. When I become a man, I'm going to buy new clothes for us. I'm going to buy groceries for us. I'm going to take care of you. You'll never pay another bill. Joe, I don't believe a woman should work unless she wants to work. If she does whatever money she earns, she should keep it for herself. A man, not a grown boy, a man provides and protects mm -hmm. his family. Yeah. And that's how my mother raised me. And I said, when I turn 18, you'll never pay another bill. When I turned 18 until my mother was 89, she never had to work again. She never paid another bill. When I was married, my wife, I said, hey, you, you work if you want to work. If you don't want to work, don't worry about it. I used to be married to Gladys Knight. I said, I'm the yeah. captain of this midnight train. You don't have to sing unless you want to sing. Can you feel the brother up in here, up in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. That's so funny. Yes. Yeah. I love it, man. I love your mindset. I love that you, you've got, you've got this like very, um, very traditional, you've got like awesome principles. You know, I think that this is the thing. A lot of people don't have principles that they live by. They just kind of float in the wind. It's like, you know how you want to show up and you grew into that. You stepped into it. You let that unfold in the way that it needed to. And you, you haven't shaken uh, along the way, you've really like showed up in a hundred percent in the way that you have desired to this whole time. And I think it's, you know, that's commendable for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we all are self-definitional. We yeah. can decide at any point in time who we want to be. That's, mm. that's our call. Nobody can take that from us. Nobody, no circumstances, no adverse situation can rob us of that choice. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve, the highest that is in you or the lowest that is in you. Mm. Les, what do you believe it takes to be mind strong? I believe it takes work. There are things that's going to happen. I mean, the, the, you know, no one ever wants to hear the three words, you have cancer. That, that statement is the most feared words in seven different languages, you have cancer. And doctor looked at me and said, you have cancer. I said, 
can you give me a second opinion, please? He said, yes, and you're ugly, too. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Did he say that? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. All right. Yeah. Oh, you're a joker. <laughs> but I had, I had to talk to myself. I remember when he was talking to me and said, cancer metastasized the seven different areas of my body. And I smiled. He said, why are you smiling? I said, man, are you serious? You said it has metastasized the seven areas of my body? He said, yes. I said, seven is my lucky number. Uh, I said, I was born <laughs> February the 17th. I said, Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Uh -huh. Naaman dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times. Mm -hmm. The Lord made the world in seven days. I said, seven is my lucky number. I said, that cancer is getting a hell beat out of it right now. I have beaten cancer so badly for the past 21 years, and three times seven is 21, and this is 2017, that the cancer rate in my neighborhood dropped by 90%. Can you feel a brother up in <laughs> here, up in here? <laughs> Damn, you gave it a whooping. <laughs> yes! I love it. I absolutely love it. That's awesome, Les. Les, when you look at the industry now, when we talk about you know self-development, you've got coaches popping up left, right, and center, and uh, you know because people are more accessible now. Anyone can brand themselves online as a coach or a speaker or an entrepreneur or whoever, right? What do you see going on in the industry now when you just with the, you know the, the um, experience you've had so far, what do you see going on in the industry now that you worry about? Maybe something that might be happening yeah. that might be like watering down the industry or that the is industry. a very that's a very good question. Yeah. I believe you don't teach what you don't know and yep. you don't lead where you don't go. Mm -hmm. I believe that People who align themselves with a coach, you want to find out what have they done? What have they accomplished? When I speak to people, I used to, I was elected to the Ohio legislature. I passed 14 bills for my first term. I went in a district that was 65% white. When I was on a small daytime radio station, I was the number one personality in Columbus, Ohio. That... I have a track record of achievement. I've been selected by Toastmasters among the top five speakers in the world. I was, I was selected by Toastmasters for the Golden Gavel Award. That's high, their highest award. I was selected by the National Speakers Association for their highest award called the CPAE Award and inducted into the National Speakers Hall of Fame. I've earned over $65 million doing this. There's no speaker who started from the place that I've come. Booker T. Washington said, judge a man not by what he's accomplished, but what he has overcome for his accomplishment. When I wrote to Gunther Rinker and said, you're producing a, a video and a show for Tony Robbins, and you're spending millions of dollars in, in cities all around the world every half hour, I said, I have a, a motivational video. I would like to partner with you. They said, we don't believe that a black person will have acceptance by the American public. So oh. Tony had the complexion of connection. I had the complexion of rejection. So what I did, see, when things happen to you, you can become better or you can become bitter. Mm -hmm. I said, I will make it my point, even though I don't have an information infomercial, but I will focus on changing lives. He's made more money than I have, but he has not changed the lives that I have. And at the end of the day, that is what I believe matters. Not how much money you have accumulated, but what impact, what legacy, as you say, what will be different because you live, because you came this way. Does that make a sense? Horace Mann yes. said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. And so I'm still working on that changing lives yes you're going for depth as opposed to width yes yes and so you have a lot of people who are focused just on the money you can make money i train these speakers i'm working with this weekend impact drives income if you change lives you're going to make some money but many of them use all type of strategies neurolinguistic programming and different other 
techniques to get people to run to the back of the room. Listen, if I can make some impact on a person's life, great. My goal is, and how I train these speakers, I said, if you transform people's lives, they will leave your presence feeling better about you, and they're going to buy your product, and they're going to tell other people about you. Don't just focus on the money. I'm not surprised when I hear certain speakers, one very beautiful person. I mean, this woman, I felt was beautiful inside out, and she was gorgeous, just a powerful voice of change, committed suicide just less than two months ago. Just blew my mind. And, yeah. and I just, I felt she was empty inside. You know, that, that, that there is, there is, I believe we can never stop working on ourselves. That it's an ongoing process. That higher levels, more devils. <laughs> you know? I you totally know? believe that. I believe that, yeah. 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 Yes, you know, you know, new levels, new devils, new stuff coming. You say, whoa, I thought you were through. You're not thinking, hey, I'm dealing with prostate cancer. God, you can't do anything after, else to me. Then I stoop over to pick up my luggage and I had a pain in my back and I dropped to my knees. Sadika pain. Man, that is pain. Unbelievable. And then my mother, she had breast cancer and she died. Then my best friend died waiting on a liver transplant. Then I went through a divorce from someone that I love very much. Whoa! I mean, it's called life. Think it not strange that you face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might, you will have tribulations. And all I say is, suck it up. I'll <laughs> <laughs> tell everybody, 80% don't care, 20% glad it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. In Australia, we say get a bag of cement and harden the hell up. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's what we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah that oh, that's funny. Yeah, and, and you know when you said like you know new levels, new devils. I've heard the saying of like the higher you climb, the darker the attic gets. You know, and wow. there, because there is that like. I mean, I don't know. I, I believe in the spiritual realm, like we were talking about before. And I feel like as you get higher up, there are these things of like power and greed and temptation and things that you see some people selling their soul in the industry. Yeah. So, and, yeah, and, be and what we have to do is stay focused on our purpose yeah. and the meaning of our lives. Don't worry about that. Don't judge it. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. But for the grace of God, there goes I. Just be grateful that you're still here. Be grateful that you have an opportunity every day to leave the world in better shape than how you found it. We have to suspend judging others because wherever we point, we have three fingers pointing at ourselves. And so I'm still growing. I'm still developing. I'm like the lady who said, Lord, I ain't what I want to be, ain't what I'm going to be. But thank God, I show sure ain't what I was. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and you know another thing that I love uh, from one of your speeches, you said, uh, if, if there's no enemy within, then the enemy outside can do, do us no can harm. Do us no harm. Yes, such a powerful. I yeah. got chills when I heard you say that. I was like, yes, that is so true. So true. Mm -hmm. Les, we're about to wrap up this interview. I've had an absolute blast with you on here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Les, thank you. Where can we uh, either get hold of you for any kind of coaching or training or, or any courses you have coming out? And where can we find you online? They can go to lesbrown.com. Lesbrown.com. Mm -hmm. They can also, if they're interested in coaching on how to tell their story, how to transform an audience individually and collectively, they can email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com. Did I tell you, seven is my lucky number. My <laughs> office in Detroit was on the 21st floor. Three times, seven is 21. I'm one of seven children. Did I tell you, seven is my lucky number. Les Brown, seven, seven at gmail.com. There you go. Don't forget it or you'll regret it. It's lesbrown77 at gmail.com. Awesome, Les. Love it, love it. Les, at the end of every interview, I always ask this one last question. This question is, 
If you were to deliver your last 30 second speech to the world, what would that last 30 seconds sound like? If you want to think bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace and sleep for it. If all that you dream and scheme is about it and life seems useless and worthless without it. And if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it and lose all your terror of the opposition for it. And if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence and stern pertinacity. If neither cold poverty, famish or gold, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want. If dogged and grim, you besiege and beset it. With the help of God, you'll get it. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy and Joe Brown's pride and joy. It's been a plum-pleasing pleasure as well as a privilege. God bless you and God bless your dream.